you know, meeting with students, staff, administration to get to where we are. Um, and it's, it's an exciting building. The more we get into it, um, the, the more excited I am about it. Um, one thing we'll talk about is, you know, time is, is critical. That's where having the CM on board will help us a lot to make sure things get done. But, you know, timing and some of these decisions that are still kind of up in the air regarding, um, you know, classroom CTE, as we get these things pinned down in the next few weeks, we really can move forward. And, um, but anyways, I'm excited to, to see what we saw, a little brief preview of this afternoon of some of the new stuff. And um, it's, it's a great times to, to be doing this, but I'll turn the time over to VCBO and I'm just clicking buttons, so I may mess you up completely. Yeah. Good? This button just clicked. No. Oh, there, look at that. We're kicking the gas. Awesome. Huh? Awesome. All right, we've got to keep okay. it in mind, Ken. Hey, guys. Uh, gosh, it's great to be here. Great to see everybody again. Uh, we're VCBO Architecture by way of introduction. I'm Vern Latham. I'm a principal, K-12 principal at VCBO. Dave Kopp, he's also a K-12 principal there at VCBO. And this is Brian, one of the best designers that we've got with uh, K-12 schools. He's done an amazing job for us with everything. Uh, Farmington High, he's done a lot of work uh, on current uh, middle schools that you probably are aware of those as well. But uh, we're really thrilled to be here and really kind of thrilled to be a part of this now that we're getting going here with this thing. And so uh, we want to bring you up to speed on kind of where we were and talk about where we are now. And so that's kind of how we've uh, set this presentation up. Is it clicking? There we go. Okay, so we're going to turn some time over to Brian, talk about the schedule. <laughs> so uh, what you see here is something that we've, we've been working on. It's been kind of a, a working plan, but uh, things are coming together quite nicely. Uh, the original uh, read kickoff of the, of the project happened in February, but really didn't start getting uh, momentum until the uh, start of last month. So actually, we're really proud of us uh, as a group, and you guys should be proud of yourselves too, because about a month ago, or a little bit over a month ago, we started saying, we really need to start thinking about getting a CM on board. And we proposed, we worked backwards from a date of bid to when we needed to get different approvals for different uh, stages of our project. And uh, we worked out that we needed a CM to be approved by today. And look at that, it just <laughs> happened. Isn't that great? So the rest yeah. of the project will go super smooth. <laughs> so let me just really quickly explain uh, how the design system works. So we come up with a, a really general broad concept based on the program that we developed with you guys a year and a half ago. Um, and then we start to look at the site and then we start to come up with a com con uh, con uh, conceptual design, and then that turns into schematic design. So that's the fra that's the the stage that we're at right now is SD. And so that's the lighter yellow that you see there. In the middle of June at the board meeting, we'll actually present. The plan is is that we'll present our schematic design to you, and that'll be the general idea of what the school will look like. Um, and at that point, you guys will sign off on it and then we'll get to work with all of the documents. We'll move into the design development stage for about a month where we really dig down with Hughes and start to really develop how the building will be built. And then after that, we spend the next four months getting into the real nuts and bolts of con uh, construction documentation, and that's what CDs are. And during that time, Hughes will be getting budgets and getting numbers and figures together so that we'll have a really good idea of how much the building is going to cost long before we go out to bid. But right after Thanksgiving, we will go after bid. So uh, and then we have a four week bid period. We'll open the bids from all of the subcontractors. Hundreds of subcontractors will want to bid on this job because it's a very appealing job. And then that buyout period will happen. And then on in early January, we'll present again the uh, guaranteed maximum price or the GMP to you guys as a board, and then we'll have a bit of time to think about it, kick, or kick it around. We'll approve it on the second week of January next year, and then we'll get to work. So that's the plan. A couple quick items if I can point out really quick. That 15th of June, this coming June, 
is a critical date. Um, so as we've, uh, we had a meeting today with the, your CMGC to kind of talk about the strategy on this and to open this project in June of 2024, working backwards, those dates are the dates we have to hit to make that happen. So as, uh, if those dates start to slide, that end date starts to slide. The problem is kids are coming. So the point is decision-making to keep those dates on track is gonna be really critical. We'll get into a little bit of that here in the end, uh, but that 15th of June date, you will see a CMGC's estimate based on a total square footage. So you'll know the square footage based on the allocation you asked us to hit of 300,000 square feet, the budget that you asked us to hit, um, and then that design so you can see the program of spaces, the number of classrooms, all of those components to make sure that it's meeting your expectation. At that point, we move into construction documents where we're really developing those bid documents at that point, okay? Okay, how we got here? Let's see the next slide. So we went through, you guys, a lot of you guys were involved in this and you probably recall some of this. Some here in the audience as well were involved in this process. Had a great visioning process that we went through. Uh, you can see there at the whiteboard, we had Nick Salmon. He is an international programmer for K-12 schools. Um, he's done work all over the world. He came in here to help us with a visioning uh, process that we went through. You can see the committee that we had there and the number of uh, stakeholders that were involved in that process. Go ahead, Dave. There it is. Okay, so we won't go through everything. This is everything that we were kind of covering in that process. But the main keys here, and I can't even read them here on the screen, but it's the world beyond Tooele County. That was number one, which was really important to understand is what's going on in the world right now in K-12 education. Visual preferences. Yeah, visual preferences is number two. And that really is bringing a lot of vision, uh, vision, visionary materials to you guys and the committee. And actually you see it there on the right and people showing preferences of what they like and what they don't like, what aesthetics they like, what they don't like, what plan types they like or don't like. Okay, and then the third thing is? Planning for learning, places for learning. Environment. Yeah, places for learning and what's happening with the learning environment and how the learning environments have changed over the past 15 years. Okay, this is more of the things that we covered here, but you can see some photos that Nick brought of what's going on with education around the world, K-12 education, and how learning spaces are created. Okay, and this is kind of the initial study, and this is what came out of that process. We call this sort of the mashup. So what came out of the committee process is they liked two buildings that, that were really, that we focused on, and Nick put this together for us. So you can see down at the bottom, they liked Farmington, the way Farmington was set up in the houses in Farmington, and they liked Rigby High School, which was really interesting. It's a high school that we did up in Rigby, Idaho. And what they liked about it was the uh, athletics and the auditorium components and how those areas could be closed off from the rest of the school. So we've tried to mash all this together and bring it all into one plan now that's going to fit your site, which was the challenge. Okay. So the, the other thing that we did, several of you participated, we uh, toured uh, several high schools to try and demonstrate some of those different features. Uh, this was the Alexandria Area High School in, uh, back in uh, Minnesota. Um, Farmington High School, several other locations to look at new concepts of collaborative learning, those types of uh, things that you might want to look at as a district as you're pursuing this new high school. The different ways classrooms look today versus the way they were when I was in school a few years back. Uh, let's see here. Come on. We, we even toured Provo uh, schools that were done by uh, other architects huh? to look at. We did Provo, we did Logan, the remodel there. We did uh, several junior highs. Alpine was Sky Ridge. And Alpine was Sky Ridge. Oh, Sky Ridge. And then we did Green Canyon, either Green Canyon or the other one that's the twin for Green Canyon. I can't remember up in Logan. Right. So. And then the committee itself, we went back to Alexandria, which was a really productive uh, tour workshop that we did back in Alexandria. Okay. We're going to do this the manual this way. Is, there, okay. we go. there we go. South slide. Yeah. yeah. Next, please. <laughs> awesome. And next slide. Okay. Project vision. So, 
Soup, you probably remember this process. This was in your conference room. Um, this was a lot of fun, but this was basically where we took all these ideas that came out of that visioning process and we started to look at how that could be uh, brought into a school. So one of the first things that we do is we create bubbles and the bubbles are kind of over there. You see them laid out on the table, but those represent spaces and how those spaces are arranged. And kind of the, uh, the learning center is what we call the heart and lungs of the school. So it's kind of the part that we want to get right. That is the most important, most essential part of the entire school to get right. And then we start to repeat that element through the building. Go ahead on the next slide. Okay, so out of that process, these are really the most important goals that came out of that. Now, these are goals that you guys had identified that you wanted in your new high school. And so let's go through these really quick. Foster small learning communities, bite-sized achievable project-based learning. That's really important um, because we need the spaces to support that. Purchasable building and program locations, integrated CTE as feasible, integrated SPED, 95% utilization, another key element, uh, teacher collaboration and future learning environments. Go to the next, there we go. So this is how those elements are actually implemented. And so you can see the small learning community down on the uh, bottom right of the screen. And that was what came out of this process that we did. And so all of those spaces that are implemented there are spaces that are represented on the left-hand side. So you've got SPED implemented in a resource room You've got a CTE studio, flex lab. Um, we've got student collaboration spaces. We've got all the components that we see on the left-hand side. Most importantly, we have a teacher collaboration area and that's where we need to put the teachers so we can increase that utilization of 95% in the building and increase that efficiency. And what's a, a, what's a high school's typical utilization rate? So in the state of Utah, we did a study up in Davis when we did Farmington, and we compared all their high schools. All their high schools averaged 65% utilization. We've also done Park City High School. That was 55%. What does that mean? So that means that at any given time during the day, let's say in Davis, 35% of the building is empty because you can't physically fill every classroom at the same time. Now, in an elementary school, it's a lot easier because most of the kids stay in those rooms most of the time during the day. So elementary schools are running at like 95% utilization. And so it's a big difference in high schools. That utilization decreases, therefore the efficiency decreases in the building. Part of the reason that happens is, as you know, in a high school, a teacher owns the classroom, typically in a traditional format. So when the teacher's on prep, that classroom is unoccupied by students. So if you have a third of your teachers on prep at any given hour, that's why you have that 65% utilization rate in your building, right? So when you see that note up there about 95% utilization, that's accomplished by taking your teachers and giving them a place outside a classroom to do their prep. That means every classroom can be utilized at the same time. Therefore, you're building fewer classrooms because they're not offices for teachers at that point. Does that make sense? The utilization, util, utilization factor also extends when you create different sizes of classrooms. Yes. So therefore, you're sure. using every square foot to your advantage. And that's why we came up with three different sizes of uh, learning studios. That's absolutely right. Yeah. And can you, um, oh, geez. Oh, yeah. One question that came up is, well, so a teacher's going to have to haul all their stuff? Yes. That's not going to apply to like a CTE teacher yeah, no. or a whatever yeah. or whatever. And at Farmington, the principal said, I know I thought this was going to be a, an issue. So he spent all this money buying these little carts <laughs> that teachers could lock their stuff in and leave it. He said no one uses them. It was a waste of his. It, he just said it was just interesting to watch it um, evolve because um, the teachers you know, math and English and social studies, social studies could and just, and yeah, they, it wasn't, so we can show wasn't you more, an issue. We yeah. can show you more clearly when we show you the actual plan for Deseret Peak, but what we have planned is that the teachers uh, that have specialized classrooms, like a chemistry lab or a bio lab or a wood shop or a metals lab, they're not gonna be moving all of their wood shop stuff from one classroom to another. Um, and that teacher collaboration area we have, they're in zones. And so there's not one teacher that's gonna be running all the way across the uh, school to yeah. do one class and then coming back to do another. They'll be in that cluster the that's entire right. time. That's right. 
Now, one thing you see on that list is future learning environments. And we, in the past 15 years, have learned a lot. And we've done a lot of research on this, as Dr. Rogers knows, and we've presented to him before, too. Um, one thing that we have learned is, is that these spaces have been unsuccessful in other projects that they've been implementing. And so that creates a lot of, uh, a lot of feedback that you guys don't necessarily want to get as a board when they're unsuccessful in that way. And so we've learned how to make them successful and what the keys are to create that success. And you see that in that plan on the bottom right. So you see the student collaboration area. So flexibility is key. So all four of those classrooms, and actually the flex lab is in the center in the final layout. Brian will show that to you. So that means every classroom in that space that touches that student collaboration area now can utilize that student collaboration area. In the past, we kind of tucked it around a corner down the hall and it would never get used because the teachers can't supervise it. Now they can supervise it, and so they have a direct connection and the ability, this is what's great for teachers, to make their classroom that normally is 900 or 1,000, now a 2,000 square foot classroom by extending into that space. So that's what that collabor or the uh, flexibility gives you. The other failed you approach. Might, you might be doing a, a lesson on something, but have a group of students that completed that. You're working with maybe students that need need some review but those students you can still see them out in the hallway they're working on a project right. and you just the differentiation ability for you so with and you can see what space. what you just said nails like four of our key learning um, what are our drivers for the design we want small purpose-based project-based learning with small groups That's I thought it was interesting that the, the committee really felt like gosh you know we not only do we have difficulty utilizing a full traditional building, but we build all the spaces the same. And so whether you have five students and could be in a smaller classroom or whether you have 45 and need a larger space, we couldn't address that because all the spaces were the same. That's right. Yeah. Now, the other part that's important, you've all heard of the open concept. That was a, a good idea that was very poorly executed. And here's why. Most people see this approach and they think open concept. The reason open concept failed was because there was no acoustical separation. So if you're in a teaching space and it's all literally physically open, and I'm teaching here and the superintendent is teaching there, the acoustics are competing and now it doesn't work. What we've learned is having visual connectivity where a teacher can be in their classroom and send five students out to do a small group project because they've maybe finished a task and they can still be seen, but acoustically it's not disrupting what's going on now it allows that concept to be very effective in its, in its usefulness, right? So that's the way that this collaboration works. If you pull collaboration visually away from a teacher, they're never gonna send their kid out there to go and, and work on a project because they can't supervise, yeah. right? And so transparency is key in this. It's, it's gonna be really important to the success of these spaces. And I think you might be getting to this, but that also leads into safety. When you can see things yeah. and you can kind of keep an eye on what's happening, yeah. that keeps your kids safer, and we'll right? Cover that. We'll cover yeah. that when we go over the plan. Thank you. Yeah. In, in brief detail. We've talked, <laughs> we've talked to we, you about why we, we don't go into too much detail there, and we won't plan on that today, yeah. but there is, uh, there's a lot of safety benefits yeah. with that that you all understand, right? And just so you guys know, too, we do have a safety consultant that is part of our consultant team, and they will be plugged into this all the way through. In fact, we have our first, we're going to bring them out on June 23rd for the first meeting, mm -hmm. and so we gonna, we're going to have those guys involved in the process. We want to make this as safe as we possibly can. Okay, next slide. Uh-huh. So uh, really quicker, Brian and I are going to cover this uh, uh, topic. I'll touch on the site plan, and then Brian will go through the details of the floor plans with you really quickly. Um, but your site is awesome. Uh, one of the challenges, though, is there's 60 feet of elevation difference from the south end to the north end. Um, and what that means is we could spend a lot of your money digging a hole, or we could put the building in the right orientation and spend more of that money on building the building itself. That's right. <laughs> now, logic would tell you Barra Boulevard, you would want to front the building on Barra Boulevard, right? The problem is there's 60 feet of fall. So you take a building that's 300 feet long over 60 feet, and you're stepping that building all over the place and spending a ridiculous sum of money to make that work. Or we turn the building to work with the, the contour lines, and now we reduce that cost significantly, 
And so you'll see that as we go to the next slide, please. Pay attention to those contour lines and their shape, their orientation. And now you see the angle of that building running basically on that same kind of southwest to northeast angle, right? Yeah, go back. Go back to there and then forward again. So you see that southwest to northeast angle of the grades. If you go forward on your slide, you'll notice that building is following that grade in the narrow dimension. So it allows us to put the portions of the building that are on the, those wings that are sticking down towards the parking lot up at a higher elevation, step at the hallway, and Brian will show you that in the floor plan, and then the walkout basement, like the superintendent was saying, that puts your gymnasium and your auditorium at a lower elevation. So we've now, we've now provided a means to use that topography to capitalize your money and use it elsewhere in student spaces. Okay, next slide, please. Go ahead, Brian. And uh, it's a happy coincidence, and uh, I'm gonna be honest with you and tell you that this was just not part of the plan, this but after today, to but after today, it's completely intentional, okay? okay? <laughs> the angle of this axis is, and there's a large hallway that goes along the whole spine of the school, and at the very furthest west end, it looks right at Deseret Peak. How cool is that? <laughs> so after today, the architects are just awesome and they know what the, exactly <laughs> what they're doing. Don't tell me that wasn't <laughs> So uh, you're recorded <laughs> and it's on <laughs> public <laughs> record, dang it. But <laughs> oh darn, <laughs> we'll have to be awesome in other ways. Oh, man. Uh, you can see your sports fields in the last slide. You could see that your baseball and your soccer and your softball and your tennis are all clustered around a central hub and um, we did that with regards to planes and plates that we wanted to create uh, along the 60 feet that drops in probably between 15 and 20 feet increments. So the main level and your front entry are all flat and it feels and looks like a very manageable two-story school at the front of the building. But at the back of the building, in that, that V-shaped opening between those two big masses, that's that opening that looks out to Stansbury Island and we'll capture this beautiful view, and we're very, very excited about it. So Again, let's, uh, back, back to your matchup, the part to the, uh, that would be the south, that is kind of more of that Farmington concept that came out of the committee process, and the part in the back, the gym and the auditorium, that's part of that, that uh, what is it, um, the Rigby, Rigby, High, yeah, School. Rigby yeah. High School. So you'll also notice on this site plan that we're already starting to embrace the idea of black and gold, and designing around the idea of the Deseret Peak Golden Eagles, which we're quite excited about knowing that beforehand. And white. And yes. white, yes. White, right. white will always be a color that architects use, but the black <laughs> and the gold is very, very unique. So uh, uh, the, the I don't know if it's gold. No, okay. it'll be gold. Straight up gold. <laughs> so um, on, the, on the far right hand, uh, left hand side of the slide, you see our bus drop there right next to the Performing Arts Center and the student entry um, and the events and staff parking right off of Barra Boulevard. And then there's also additional parking up in the, fur the further north part for athletic, most mostly visitor parking for sports. And then there's another small parking lot at, at the far north for soccer and baseball. Can you move back one slide, please? Yeah, go, just go back one slide, please, TJ. DJ, <laughs> thanks, DJ. <laughs> <laughs> so those are the things that you can see. So the, the two soccer fields, uh, and the baseball field and the tennis courts are at one level down basically at the Home Depot level. You can see the Home Depot dip there on the right hand side of the, of the screen. And then we have a natural grade that fl flows up to the softball field and the parking lot that's at the, the north end of the football the stadium. And then another jump up to the stadium and the, the lower level of the um, athletics and performing arts. And then another level up for our main entry and the academic wings. And one other quick thing to point out on this slide, you'll notice on the left side of Barra Boulevard, there's two kind of shaded little areas and then down at the south uh, east corner, there's a couple. The uh, architects for the LDS Church have been in touch with us just trying to coordinate where they might choose to purchase a piece of property for the seminary building. Why does that matter in this context? It, it, it matters because we need to make sure on, on this site that we're designing for you circulation for students, wherever it is they're going, is managed properly. We don't want to have them walking across drop zones and straight through parking lots. We want to make sure there's a fluid transition. 
So they've been very helpful to be able to just tell us here's what we're thinking so we can make sure we get sidewalks configured in a way that will work as efficiently as possible for those students that are util utilizing that resource. Right. And once we know that, we can design around it a little bit better. Um, but uh, until then, it's kind of a floating, floating target. But that's the site. If you want to go ahead and go uh, forward two slides. Um, so this is the lower level. So this is the, that, that V shape as you look out to Stansbury Island. Um, you can see our light blue on the right hand side is our athletic department. And we have a main gymnasium with uh, many basketball court, uh, courts, a main court and adjacent courts around there. We also have an auxiliary gym, mostly for PE. And we wanna have a conversation about what that floor is. At other gyms and auxiliary gyms, we've done that out of a sports court rather than a maple floor. And what that means is it allows your, your field sports to come in and use the auxiliary gym in the winter without wrecking the maple floor. Things like that, we'll wanna have those conversations. You can see our wrestling room and then our court sports and PE locker rooms that are off to the side across the corridor and then lots of storage and things like that around that around the athletic. There's a clear divider between uh, the, the light gray and the dark gray just at the, at to the bottom of the athletic and that'll be a divider that can make it so that the athletic part of the, of the building can be isolated and closed off for events at night. On the other side of the student uh, courtyard is, a, uh, is our performing arts. And you have a 1,200 seat auditorium with a fly loft, a, a, a small theater uh, with changing rooms and that can also act as a green room for the, for the stage. And then um, a, a big, very big upgrade to um, your normal high school plan is that you have a band room and an orchestra room and a choral suite. And then again, and a black box, right? A little theater. We're a little theater. It. Okay. So little what that we be? decide on orchestra pit or no? I can't remember that. Right now we're showing orchestra pit. It's you can fill it in and not use it because a lot of the plays are using um, the, the soundtrack. The soundtrack yeah. from the, you know that they purchased from different things like Cats or whatever you know that, that Matilda, yeah. and. Um, um, but if you don't, it's uh, much harder to come in afterwards. If you want to bring orchestra in there right. and play, you obviously can't if you don't Very have difficult. a pit. Yeah. So. Um, and most high schools contract with the, the, pit, the pit covers for a contract of twice a year, and it's a, a couple grand. It's, it's uh, quite economical once you've built it in. Um, and again, those are, those are things that we'll want to develop over the next month, and all of those answers that we'll want to have um, is a scene shop and storage, I, I just know from Stansbury High School from talking with Glenn Carpenter, you know, three or five time state drama champion that. And he was part of, he was part of the development. Yeah, of the, the that, that scene shops and dressing rooms and storage and stuff like that are often woefully small. So green room facilities yeah. to come out onto the, the stage. So we have that when the little theater is set up as that green room function. So our sheen shop is, is um, a little bit bigger than what we did at Farmington and we haven't had any complaints at Farmington. You can see it in the orange block, it's the upper uh, right hand corner. And there's a small, that indent in there is actually a yard that can be closed off with a fence for exterior Out. work on scenery and okay. stuff like that. And there's a large roll up door on both the outside of that and then at the back of the stage for large scenery to be moved into the building. Um, and then the auditorium can also be closed off to the rest of the school um, at an angle at the, in the commons, the dark gray blob in the middle is our commons area. And the green area is actually our kitchen and our cafeteria. So that uh, to the right of the green area, you'll see a gray square. And that's actually an exterior space that'll be um, the open space for deliveries of all kinds. Receiving that brown box in there is where our receiving area is. And uh, the receiving for the kitchen but also receiving for CTE, welding, and our commercial industries there. Yep. Before we, we move on to the next slide, you, you guys have probably noticed we, we get Twitter pated about this stuff, so we could talk for four years <laughs> on all this cool stuff. We get really excited. So you, you better give us a, take five more minutes, take 20 more minutes. <laughs> you, you tell us what you want us to cover, and we'll give you the detail in that time. Is there a time frame you want us to hit while we're talking here?
we can take an hour if you want an hour, <laughs> we can, whatever you want. Sure, <laughs> we're easy. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, also, feel free to interrupt us yeah. if you if there's something that Please. doesn't make sense or if you don't understand. I was just gonna say that I really, really hope board members, you know, and I love. I hope that our public is watching this because this is really cool to see. And um, anyways, I'm hoping questions will come up. I feel bad. Some of us asked the questions at you know when we went to tour and. Uh, I know that's why Camille brought up one, and sure. you know, I'll try and bring some up from questions that we have that are had that maybe we think sure. the public would be wanting to hear. But does anyone? I let, let me maybe give you the hey, format of the rest Madam of this so you know where we're gonna what okay. we're gonna cover, and that may tell you where you want to have your question brought in. Okay, okay. so we're gonna go through the next the two uh, remaining floor plans. At the end of that, then we're gonna step into two outstanding issues that we need. Uh, district direction on in order to maintain our schedule that will relate to the gymnasium a little bit and it will relate to the CTE so we'll talk about those and then we'll wrap up touching back again on the schedule so as we're going through these floor plan pieces if you see spaces that you're wondering how does that work or why are we doing this that's the time to ask those questions we, we will touch on schedule at the end so if there's more schedule questions let's hold them to that one um, and then anything else you want to throw in that's just fine also, uh, Melissa, this is Scott Bryan. Scott, yes. Um, I, I, well, their presentation is great and I, you know and, and useful. I think that as a board member, you know, this is the first time that uh, we've had a chance to actually have this kind of conversation, and um, I think that there's numerous questions and, and concerns that I have. Uh, through this process, and and so while they get Twitter pated to quote them about the the school, um, I, I think that we need some time to have some conversations. Um, well, so and that's why that this like, is the time. And, and maybe it needs to be taken offline from this meeting, frankly, or or maybe it needs to be another meeting because I think that there's some fundamental um, concerns that I have that have not. I've never had a forum to address those, and I'm a little bit concerned that we're, we're going down that path um, without having that dialogue. And, and is, you know, that's going to be your call if, if it's, or the board's call if it's the best use of time to continue with this or if you want them to continue to go through. It's not so much about the school, but it's about some fundamental philosophical things that I'm having some concerns on. So, and, and if I'm the lone voice and we want to just keep going down a tour of the building, that's great. And uh, you know, I'll sit back and, and hold those questions. But um, I, I think that we do need to have a conversation at some point about you know if we're even on the right path. And that's my two bits. Um, okay. So from from my perspective, this is the time to do it. We do have some other things on the agenda. If we don't get to the ag the agenda, this is uh, important. This is why we put it number one on the agenda. Scott, I don't. I don't think this is the wrong time to talk about all of this because we just approved the CMGC today and let's, uh, S Scott, I appreciate your question. Let's get all the questions out. And that's why I was saying, if you have questions along the way, let's ask them if you, if we don't, you know, I, I mean, these are just, if you look at these, these aren't like official floor plans yet. These are just the mashups. Right. And so this is definitely the time to ask the questions and get them answered. So, I mean, I, right? Is that okay? I, does, ever, does anyone as a board member not want to dive deep into this topic? Does anyone have any? Maybe what we ought to do is have them kind of finish up what they were just mentioning and your concerns, what you need direction from us. And then in that process, Scott, if you'll bring up your concerns and your questions, because I have a feeling they're going to mesh and they're going to combine and kind of get a conversation going. Uh, except that I think fundamentally, some at least what they said that their issues that they need to resolve are are much past the, the questions fundamentally. I, I, I have some fundamental questions just about uh, philosophy and some other things here that would probably make them take a step back 
And, and their questions may be at a much higher level than the detailed questions that they're asking. Well, I think that, let's talk about it right now. Let's, I mean, let's, if no one else has questions, I mean, well, I, I mean, you have questions. I hope others will continue to have, will get questions. I think, Scott, you could spark some questions on others, but let's get started with questions. If, if you don't, I think that's a great way to do it. So. Commenting that, you know, we were tasked, I understand that some of you are new to the process, but when we started this, it was long before we even failed the pass the bond the first time. And the reason for that was we needed to have an idea of what we were asking, right? And so the board at that time said, uh, even before we selected them, what do we even want before we, because we got to go to the taxpayers and we got to have an idea of how much this is going to cost. And so we put together a pretty broad committee and said, let's do work. So it, it wasn't top down. It wasn't board driven. It was kind of grassroots bottom up. And, uh, and I will tell you, everybody didn't agree, but through the process of a lot of the visits and the, the visioning and the workshops and, and, and you didn't even show the countless number of teacher groups that you brought in from each area. Um, it was kind of built from, you know, feedback from our residents kind of a thing. And, you know, in hindsight, maybe we should have had, uh, you know, board members more actively involved at that time, um, as opposed to just waiting and, and being the, you know, the governance policy structure, but have them involved in that. And that in hindsight, maybe could have helped with some of the philosophy question or philosophical questions. <coughs> well, and I, and I can start, I could, a I can throw out a question or I can ask. Because I appreciate the tour. I, I got to go uh, see Farmington, and this is the first time that I'd seen a con that concept. And it's a great building. Please, please don't anybody misunderstand what I'm saying. But my, my concern is, is Farmington and, and some of these others are built around a philosophy of education, right? And they've, they've been built around a philosophy of how they hire. I mean, I asked in depth, you guys were there. I probably took way too much time, right, asking questions. Well, but not at all. Uh, not at all. but uh, how they hire and how they staff this building was completely different concept than, than a lot of districts, including ours, has been through. And so my I guess my concern is, is, yes, this is a great building, but are we building it for a concept that we're not adopting? Because I haven't heard that, I haven't heard the discussion, on, and I wasn't privy to that. I understand that, Superintendent. I wasn't in those earlier meetings because I wasn't on the board, but I haven't heard the discussion about where are we at as far as how are we going to put our philosophy, or how does that fit our philosophy? And, and so that concerns me a little bit because one is I think we have to protect the taxpayer dollar, and if we're going to get to the point that we have to, because I don't, you know, our budget is not Farmington's budget, but, you know, we talked about that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we down, we have to downsize this project. So how does that mesh with our, with the educational philosophy? Bob, let me just say just two parts of that, and you guys jump in, but the first one, one of the, you know, the board did have this opportunity to discuss. If you'll recall, we talked quite a bit about the first one was utilization and whether we wanted to move our teachers or move our kids and that our, with the way our prep time worked, we, that we weren't utilizing our buildings. And so that was a key component before we went to the bond is to say to taxpayers, hey, we're gonna utilize more of this building and not have wasted space 65, 70%. So that was one discussion. The second one was the, if we always do what we've always done, that's what we're gonna get. Uh, the, the whole organization is perfectly designed to get the results that it is. So it was that discussion and debate of status quo. You know, quite frankly, we've struggled with PLCs for lots of years. And we've done better, and some schools have done better, and, and other. But at our high schools, one of the problems identified was lack of collaboration and kind of siloed departments. And it, we even built it into our schedule and we tried it multiple ways, et cetera. So the, the, the other piece was let, whatever we do, let's get people out of their classrooms and interacting with students and with 
each other in meaningful ways other than on the collaboration Fridays kind of a thing. Those were just two elements of, of us talking about what is it that we've done and what is it that we're lacking and we'd like to see done, done more. But so, Superintendent, you, you nailed that uh, in terms of how we look at that. And Bob, I would, I would point out a, a distinction that I think is important because we as architects um, design these spaces. We design spaces to be flexible. So we don't design a solution to one specific methodology of education. So what's challenging here is if we take the Davis model of their curriculum delivery and we try and marry that to the architecture, mm -hmm. it starts to confuse two issues. So you can actually teach in Farmington in that architecture, if you will, in the building, the physical space, in a traditional format. You can traditionally teach in Farmington if that's the way the district chooses to teach. You can also teach somewhere in between what Davis chooses to do which certainly is different from most other districts in the state, to be honest. And that's okay, it works for them. You guys aren't Davis, you're not Alpine, you're not Washington County School District. It needs to be a building that will accommodate what you need today, tomorrow, in five years, and in 20 years, because this building's gonna be there for 75 to 100 years. So what we're talking about here is flexibility that facilitates whatever you need in that time. The key, though, is collaboration. So if we build it to not be collaborative, which means a teacher can send some students outside the classroom and still visually supervise, you can't, you can't inexpensively modify a building that isn't set up that way to then suddenly be that. If you imagine going to uh, your high schools right now and trying to put collaboration in them, it's very costly and very challenging. So that's really what we're talking about is giving you a flexible building that can accommodate whatever teaching model you choose to use as a district. It's not just challenging, more often than not, it's unsuccessful because it's not laid out the way it should be laid out. And so you think of a double loaded corridor, like at Stansbury or Provo High, it's very, if you go in and carve out an open space, it's never gonna get used or lived, utilized because it's around the corner and down the hall. So this, the way it's designed, like Dave said, it's designed around collaboration, whether you use the collaboration or not, now or in the future, that's different. One thing that came away, that I, I took away from the Alexandria tour, is we had, what was great about that is uh, we actually met a good bit of time with the uh, principal there. Principal spent a good, his name is Chad Duenhauger. You guys probably remember Chad. But uh, Chad had the, the uh, unique opportunity to open this school. And so he knew the challenges that were involved in moving an existing curriculum or an existing staff from the old high school to the new. So what they did is they did it over several years. If you asked Chad again, he said he would do it different. But they did it over several years and they did it that way because professional development was incredibly important to the success of that school. And so you can slowly go into this school if you've got existing staff issues, if that's the mm -hmm. concern, or you can just teach traditionally in the school. But you have the option at this point to teach any way so you wanna teach. But, so this is Scott. Scott, go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned that we have the option of teaching traditionally, but I would take exception to that because if we're doing a utilization model of 90%, uh, 95%, as you, you, you described, um, the, the traditional model of, of each teacher having their own classroom is not going to happen. Um, because we're opening effectively at, at full capacity. So if we were to go to a, a traditional model with you know, a teacher having a classroom, um, you know, very much the traditional model, um, we would either open a school that's a 2A or a 3A school and we wouldn't have enough seats and enough rooms. So it, it fundamentally, we have to decide you know, what about teacher utilization and classroom utilization? I also wanted to point out though that, and, and I take exception to the superintendent and, and you know, the, the conversation that, or the point that we had a discussion with the board and, and I, I don't want to waylay this, but I feel as though the board was not involved in those conversations about that he referenced. And so, um, I, I will take exception to that, um, and also even the collaborative nature necessarily about some of those committees. Um, I've heard feedback from 
members of district staff or district office, I guess specifically, that felt like uh, they were uh, led to what they were told that they needed to do and that that was not a collaborative discussion. So I think that um, I, I personally take exception to that. And, and I think that as a board, we do have a responsibility to our community. Um, I, my biggest concern is that we're building a school that's, uh, while it's fully utilized on the day one, Historically, one of the ways we've been able to flex our needs is that those empty classrooms are not empty. Um, we're using those for the growth. We buy teachers those extra prep periods out, and those teachers end up teaching 100% of the period. Um, we don't have that ability. If, if the school's open at 95% capacity uh, and we wanted to buy a teacher's prep period out, we could do that, but we'll have nowhere for them to teach. And so immediately the school's going to be at capacity and we're going to be looking at additions and, and bonding to build a school to the size that we need. So I, I have some real concerns about that. I feel like we're doing a disservice to our taxpayers that we're going to be looking at bonding in the future or remodeling or additions. Um, I, I, it, it, as a board member, I'm, I'm just sick about the thought that we're gonna spend $100 million on a bleeding edge school, not, not even cutting edge, we're on the bleeding edge of, of this discussion. And we're gonna be looking at, you know, additions and bonding so in such a short order. I just would, Madam President, just like to clarify one thing, and that is we're building this school for 1800 and we're planning on having 1200 so it's not accurate to say that it will be at full capacity it will be at the classrooms will be utilized right. but um you know there's some flexibility there so it's it, it, it's designed around 1800 and if you take our secondary population of 9 through 12 and you divided it between stansbury and tooele it's going to roughly be 12. i don't we haven't done boundaries whatever so there's there's a 600 student growth that's built into that model you know, and I would add to that superintendent that you could easily get 2,000 kids in the building if you needed to. Um, and that's what other districts do as well. They just increase the number of kids in their classrooms or they, they work it out through scheduling, but but it has that capacity. And that's what I was going to say. You know, Scott, um, you and I a lot of times agree on taxpayer stuff. And um, to me, it's, it's interesting because I feel like I owe it to the taxpayer to utilize our buildings. And um, was it you, were you guys telling us that if like Stansbury had a utilization thing, there would be zero portables on that parking lot? It, what, who was telling us about how if, so anyways, they, I don't know. Know who it was? Come on, you, call me a bone here. Had, Anyways, if, they if were you just, had collaborative space for teachers, you wouldn't have any portables at Stansbury because teachers would have a place to collaborate, and all your rooms would be oh, used. Oh, maybe that's what it was. Well, anyways, but my issue is, I remember when we were bonding the first time when we did not uh, the first time it did not pass. Now, granted, there was a tax increase, but um, I had some constituents say, you know. This, your Stansbury's not full. My grandkids have, you know, only eight kids in their classroom. And I thought, man, there's no way that's true. Well, then, and I, I'm not sure eight was the number. Please, I'm not quoting someone directly, but that was the that was the thing. And I thought, well, maybe there's an AP class or a something class that does have less kids in it. But then you've got your English and math and science that have 45 or 40 kids in it. And that's what to me, this building, when I went and saw some of those classrooms, I'm like, man, as, my, as a teacher, you don't want 45 kids in your classroom, but it's happening, mm -hmm. and it will, and it does, and we're utilizing that bigger classroom space, and then if there's an AP class or a, I don't know, whatever class that's offered that doesn't have as many, they get put in that smaller classroom space, and it seems to me a utilization is far better. The only thing, Scott, that I I know that people were concerned about is teacher collaboration space. At Farmington, each teacher had their own office. And, you know, I think as um, sometimes teachers, you just need to be by yourself for a second. So I kind of, you know, that was my only concern 
on that, but then it is the PLC issue of, you know, where do they collaborate? But I, anyways, I think that to me is one of my concerns is, you know, you're hearing teachers and when I taught, there's just, you get your kids out the door and you need 20 minutes or 45 minutes, however many you have to zone out and not be surrounded by people. So my concern may be that teacher collaboration, but then I know PLCs in our district are super important. So I think that's going to be a discussion, but I see this utilization building, Scott, as, and I don't know who else, as something very powerful to be able to take to our patrons and say, look, we're building this building to um, utilize it, and we don't have to have as, as much this or as much that because it's being utilized. So anyways, that's, that's, that's my rebuttal to you, Scott. I don't know, but I know that other board members have concerns and I think we need to bring them up and talk about them and hopefully our constituents are listening and being able to give us feedback because at the same time, you know, our educators. So anyways, okay, uh, Bob. Well, I really didn't think my mic was on, but that's okay. I'll, I, I'll have, I understand collaboration, you know. Uh, I, I was involved with the, the onset of PLCs in our district and everything else. I understand collaboration. I understand all those, all those factors. And yes, I, ha I have a concern about how we have pods of teachers versus office of teachers. And I, I voiced that concern at, at, you know, in the other, in our tour. But, but I, I just don't, you know, I understand how it could aid, but I guess my philosophy is a building doesn't meet, it really does, the building may have a little bit of influence on collaboration. It's not going to solve our collaborative problem. You know, uh, but I do, my real question was, help me understand your design schedule, okay? If I read this right, and just correct me if I'm wrong, jump right in there and tell me I'm, I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, in, the, in the design development, is that where everything is finalized? Is that what you're talking about? No, so uh, this gets a little bit in the weeds, but it's important to understand. We, we work with a program called Revit, and it's a 3D, a 3D parametric modeling program. So when we draw a wall, it's not two lines on paper. It's actually the three-dimensional wall, the entire assembly of masonry, insulation, studs, sheetrock, top to bottom with a cap on the top of it. And so as we're building those, we're actually building that in the schematic design phase. So traditionally, when we used to draw with a pencil, the design development phase was very long because that's where you start taking single line drawings and now you're changing it to door widths and those types of things. Today, with the way we model in a parametric modeling system, most of that happens in the schematic phase. Okay. So the design development phase is only one month because we simply transition from um, a graphical expression of what we're doing, meaning we don't show all the lines of the wall. We show a, a mass of, of color. When we go to design development, we start to add more detail, but that's a couple clicks of a mouse and a few things like that. And the construction documentation is where we're now detailing, dimensioning, cutting sections, those kinds of things. Does okay, that so make sense, Bob? Yeah, okay. so that helps. That, I think that helps me be able to formulate my next question or my next comment. So if I look at that, this by June 15th, you want that to be pretty much done. And that's where it's pretty much set. This is what our areas are. This is what the CTE areas are. This is what all the different areas look like, right? See, in my, in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, I, I, have a much, I have, would have a much better understanding if I was looking at what, not just the concept, but if I was looking how it was actually being applied in our, in our instance. Because I think that's where, as a board, you know, uh, you could, you know, in my time it was drawings on the table, right, okay? But as a board, then we could sit down and we could say, we're concerned about this. Or, you know, and, and that meeting, sure, has to, would, you know, that time frame would have to happen before June 15th. It would have to be a work meeting or possibly a work meeting that that was the only thing on it that sit down and talk about this is what this is what it looks like. Bec and and then one other question and I'll be quiet for a minute anyway. 
Uh, buyout. Tell me what a buyout is. What's that buyout time frame? So let's start with the last question because that's quick, and then we'll hit the other one. Buyout is when the general contractor, your, your CMGC, Hughes, receives bids in from, from their subcontractors. They get those numbers. Now they have to vet them. They have to look at okay. every bid and make sure, did they miss something? Is there a duplicate? That's the buyout phase before they come to you and say, this is the accurate number without duplication. Okay. So the, the first question you had, um, I, it, one of the challenges that, that you all face as a board is not all of you were here a year and a half ago when we went through a lot of this process. So the schematic design phase, the whole phase happened a year and a half ago, meeting with, um, mem with district staff, teachers, um, curriculum directors, parents, students. We had large committee meetings and it ran for several months to go through every department from theater, from performing arts, athletics, CTE, um, all of the, uh, the um, English, math, science, all of those groups to make sure that we were addressing those specific needs. So when we're presenting this design, what you're seeing today is something that was developed for a year and a half, roughly, right? And so ultimately it's the district's decision. This is your building. We don't want you to feel like DCBO is coming in and trying to say, you need to do whatever we say. You're gonna operate this building and it needs to function. If the district decides that we need to back up and reconsider issues that were previously determined, we can certainly do that. That's, that's your choice. We just want you to understand the impact of those kinds of, of choices of backing up and, and kind of restarting that schematic process. That goes back to the schedule discussion of the opening date is June of 2024. The contractor needs X number of days to build the building. That's just how it has to be. They've got to have that number of days which means we have to get those decisions made to meet that schedule. If we want to push that out and spend time developing stuff, we can do that. The, the challenge though, Bob, is if, if the board wants to look at what we would call construction documents, which means there's doors, there's windows, you can see the swing of the doors, so you can decide if I'm in that classroom, here's how I walk through the hallway to the room, here's the window I'm gonna see, and there's how I go in the door. The challenge is if at that point you decide I don't like it, the district has spent five months of dollars of the design team developing that to then change and back up. So the way we usually handle that is we like to take you to spaces that are already built, that you can stand in it and you can say, I see how this works, I like that, I really don't like that. And then our job is to take those pieces that you do and don't like and make sure we get the pieces that work and put them in and then we try and work with you at a schematic level where we haven't invested all that time that we then risk losing. So that's why you're not seeing the detail that you're, you're hoping that you would see is we're trying to make sure we're in the right direction before we spend too much of your money. Does that answer the question? I, I think, I, yeah, and, and, and you know, like I said earlier, I think going and, and seeing Farmington helped uh, me understand mm -hmm. some, of the, some of the concept. And, and Superintendent, I wasn't involved in any yeah. of the initial process, so that's why I'm asking all these questions. Absolutely. And I wasn't involved in, in the discussion of the philosophy or, you know, uh, my, my, only, my only resource is, is I've seen certain buildings through the years and I've seen some that work, some that, we, you know, my fear always has always been, do we move in and all of a sudden now we're just not big enough? Because we've seen that happen. We've seen moving portables in at a relatively fast mm -hmm. rate because we didn't get the building big enough or whatever to start with. That's a good point. And, and I think that's where Scott's coming from is, you know, I think that's what, I think those are some of the safeguards that we have to look at is where are, you know, we're, we're growing. I think, mm -hmm. I think one of our challenges are our county's growing at a faster rate than anywhere in the state. And so we can, we can say that we're gonna be at the 1200 mark, mm -hmm. but we could be, we could overshoot that 1200 mark too and, and have a very small margin of when we're hitting capacity and when we're looking to rebond. We only have a certain budget is one yeah, of the problems. I, and, I, and I understand that. Up that. Against. The other thing I would say is, I mean, I actually thought it was a very collaborative process. I respect people's rights to disagree with that, but I've been here when we built Dugway High, when we built Sterling, and when we built Old Mill, and this is a relatively new requirement. We've never had, I'm, I talked to Steve West. Steve, are you here? 
did we ever run specific construction documents by the board? I'm not saying we can't do that, but we just have never or not known to do that. And uh, but I am going to do the research and show you uh, historically what we've talked about because we have brought that several several times uh, with board members in the past. But you know, this is a year and a half ago that we started on this project. I'm concerned that we don't honor the work that by our people that was put into this. I mean, we. I didn't come along very easy. I like, I'm more traditional, but really what, I don't think we have anything to lose by saying, you know, we're not really pleased with our high school achievements. It's not totally the, uh, it, it might be teaching, it might be other things, it's not totally, but our nine through 12 gets kind of stuck and kind of plateaued. So, so why not try something new and then you just, you pull your best minds together from all different apartments and. And you and you explore and you look at what your problems are. So that that's where we came from. I, I honestly thought, and I apologize. I honestly thought we were very collaborative. Uh, okay, really quick, we've got a question from Julia and then Camille in that order, please. Okay, so from my perspective, and I went to lots of bus schools a couple of summers ago. I think that some of the concerns, especially with Scott, comes back to our basic philosophy of collaboration. So we need to decide, do we, so the building isn't going to cause collaboration, the building isn't going to do anything with that except for provide an opportunity for it to become more often. So if our, if our teachers are all together in a in a hub, there, it's more likely they are going to collaborate than if they're in individual classrooms. But that is a decision that giving that opportunity, because on the flip side, I get there are times when teachers want a minute alone. Like, I don't want to be around that. And that, that, that has been my give and take. But Farmington, I mean, they have everything. But I don't think the collaboration with the individual offices was addressed. I mean, that was basically like almost oh. putting somebody in their same room. Mm -hmm. So but if you go to the next slide, we can maybe look at that and answer the questions with the plan as we go. Because we feel like these are topics and conversations that we've had multiple times. And, and the plan actually reflects that. So it's really important. And uh, you quoted us on saying Twitter paid it. We are passionate about our designs because we feel like what we've done is harness the energy of what came from that programming event, and then we're turning it into the actual plan of what we're going to build. So a large part of what we do requires passion. It requires us to get excited about it, and we are very excited about this design. But in reality, what we're going to do is give you what you want. And our job is to, is to just absorb all of what you want and then reflect that in a building. And so we feel we've done that now, and we just want to make sure that you guys all feel that we've done it as well. Julia, did, did, <coughs> did you get through your question? Well, I mean, I just think that, that that's a, an essential thing that we've got to figure out here. But the other thing is, I mean, we've kind of capped school sizes uh, yeah. of what we think is a good size for a school to be. So. I think this is that size. I mean, and even though you're not using every single room in every other building, it's still capped at a certain amount of students for educational, our educational philosophy. So I think that that argument is yeah. kind so of. Yeah. Well, go ahead, Brent. I was going to add just really quick. Um, you know, we we've said Farmington a lot tonight. And I want to reassure you guys, it's a great school up there, but this school, like Brian said, this is your school. It's going to be a Tooele school, and all that feedback that we got has created a school that's going to work for Tooele and school district. And it represents every person in this community and every person involved in that process. And so it's going to be better than Farmington. I, I can assure you that. And what we've put together, working with your staff, it, it's a fantastic facility. And so. I feel bad every time we say the word Farmington. So I just want to just say that to you guys that it, it's very much your school. So can I ask, because it's a follow up with hers. <laughs> okay. mm -hmm. Sorry, 
Um, so, so you mentioned it was your concern that because there were offices, then the teachers weren't collaborating. Is that what you were saying? Well, Okay, so it's, it's not the, I mean, it's the same thing. Teachers are in rooms now and we provide collaboration time. But when they're in an actual hub, it's a more, more of an opportunity because if you're passing, if you're right there, if you're sitting across from the person <coughs> in a cubicle, you have a question about a student, you have a question about a strategy. I mean, the teachers that we talked to that were in session when we did these at first really were nervous about it, but they really appreciated a lot of them. Some of them didn't. Some of, and some teachers probably can't teach in this building. They need to stay in the traditional one. But um, the opportunity to say, hey, you know, they were right there. How, how, did, how did you teach this? What was this strategy? What was this student? How, you know, but so it, it, it creates an opportunity because right now our PLCs are not doing what we had hoped they would do. Okay. So Julie and Valerie, maybe if a little context will help on this question. Farmington High School, um, they decided, there you go, saying it again. There you go. But they, <laughs> yes, the other high school that shall not be named, how's that? There you go. The, the reason that that has individual offices was a security decision. It wasn't a collaboration decision or a, a um, turning away from collaboration. It was specifically the idea of putting more adult eyes on the street, if you will, where all the kids were. So that was the priority at the time when that school was designed. In Granite School District right now, in their traditional school, existing schools, they're going in and tearing out classrooms and building teacher collaboration suites. And in those suites, it's up to 30 teachers in one suite with systems furniture, right, the little cubicles. Um, in uh, Alexandria Area High School, and we toured that, some of you will remember that went, we, there was a teacher sitting in the collaboration suite when we came in, if you all remember. And we came in, we asked him, how do you, how do you like this instead of a single office? And we were all certain that he was going to be like, I want my own office. And he said, well, you know, there's a few, somebody cooks some popcorn or something, I've got to smell it, right? But beyond that, he said, I love being able to, to talk to my, my teachers in my area about a student, what's going on. And he did make one comment. He said, there's not a lot of uh, privacy in the design. And so during that conversation, when we all talked, the discussion was, can we find a way that provides a means to have privacy where a teacher could go into a, a small room and make a phone call, sit down and have a private moment. They're not sitting there in this big open plan office kind of configuration, but when they need to collaborate, they can. And I guess the point is, we, we don't want you to think that you either are, are in a big open plan with a bunch of systems furniture, or you have an individual office or a classroom. You can take that open area, create a conference room where three teachers could go in and have a private conversation about a student that's having a challenge and they don't want to have it a big public conversation. You can have small phone spaces where there could be a private phone call that's completely private. There's a lot of ways we can skin that cat as long as we understand what it is that's your priority. The challenge for you guys is to decide two things. One, is collaboration important in your district? If it is, going back to, uh, to Scott's comments about traditional versus non-traditional approaches, you can collaborate in a traditional space. The issue is if we have teachers in a, in a teacher's collaborative office space and pulled out of the classroom, he, he's right. That mean, what we've done there is we've taken classrooms, we've reduced them because you don't need teachers in classrooms at that point, right? So we've used that square footage to buy collaboration, okay? So that's one question. Do you want teachers in the classroom or not? If you want them in the classroom, we just have to build enough classrooms. If you see the value in saying, I don't want to build classrooms of 900 square feet for one teacher. Instead, I'd like these offices and I want to recapture that square footage and use it in other applications, we can do that, right? The second question is the collaboration. Whether the teachers are in the office or in the classroom, if the space is set up to, to accommodate collaboration with transparency, a space right in front of the classroom where teachers can send kids, that can be done in a traditional school. We've done it before. So it, it's questions you guys need to answer of, do the teachers land in the classroom or not? And do we embrace the collaboration or not? and then we can make that system work based on those decisions. Excuse me. <laughs> Does that answer that question? Okay. So, sorry, okay, Camille, let's do Camille, and then 
You want to come back to you? Okay, Camille. Oh, go I was just going to. Oh. I was just going to draw a line under under that. Right now, where we stand is if you look at the plan, what we have are these modules that are basically repeated three times. You can see as it goes up in the diagonal. And the module that is up at an angle at the top of each of the things, just above that little purple dot there, um, that is the teacher collaborative area. And that teacher collaborative area is, is designed to hold around 10 to 12 teachers that are can be collaborative with one another. But also you'll see that there's two or maybe even three little rooms that, that uh, a private conversation can happen in. Or as you were saying, uh, uh, Board Member Rich, you were saying the idea of, man, I just need to down tools for 20 minutes and just turn off the lights. It could be used for that too. And the idea that a teacher would, would need to sprint across the school or teach in one area then clear across for the other, that's, a, that's something that doesn't need to happen. They can be in that cluster. And a large part of this collaboration you're right, is aided by the design of the building, but it's really the leadership moving forward and who you hire as your principal and who you hire as your leadership moving forward and the people that you bring in to be the teachers in that space. Um, I just wanted to actually talk about, cause so I've been on the board, what, two and a half years, and I remember when we came in, we sat down with the different committees and talked and had some different ideas. Um, I'm going to actually have you guys step to the side, and Dr. Ernst, will you come up and talk for just a second? <laughs> I'm just wondering if you will talk about the prep periods, like what Scott brought up, and is that ideal? Do we want our teachers, do we want to be buying out their preps, or is it better to be in a situation where they're not teaching all day long? No, actually, yeah, we want our, our teachers to be on their prep hour. We want them to have that, that downtime for not just correcting papers and lesson planning but also to to be away from students and you know have have that personal time uh, a couple things that that I will say along those lines is that it's important to know that even though those collaboration spaces are designed to hold 10 to 12 teachers there's not going to be 10 to 12 teachers in there at, at all the time you know you might have two or three uh, in in on an off day, you know, on a teacher work day, they may all be in there. Um, and the other thing is, is we currently have teacher collaboration spaces created by our teachers in our classrooms, but because here's how it works. Hey, everyone come down to my room and let's meet. You know, so here's a teacher collaboration space that we're building in naturally to this building um, to take away that need, you know, I mean, it, it provides the need so when the students are in class, we have the collaboration space. The other thing that I'll say is uh, Vern mentioned we need to answer these questions about what is our collaboration theory and what are we doing. I propose to you that those questions have already been answered. They've already been answered through this entire process we've gone through for the last year and a half. I looked at one of the pictures. There were board members in there. There were classified staff. There were certified staff principals from each of our high schools at that time were there answering these questions. Um, each people, I remember one activity, we each had a vote and we voted on different things. Um, I, I don't know who says this was not a collaborative effort, but man, this was extremely collaborative. And so I propose to you that the, the questions that are being asked tonight have already been answered They've been answered by our employees. They've been answered by our administrators. They've been answered by our students who are also there as part of that process. So while we can we could debate philosophy, educational philosophy, all night long, but for the purpose of building this new building, those questions have been answered. So did I answer both your questions? Absolutely, thank you. Yeah. The other thing I will say also, from a master schedule standpoint, and Mr. Ham can probably back me up on this. This building is a dream. 95% utilization, which was board driven. Man, to be able to use 95% of your building all the time, that's a dream when it comes to creating a master schedule. Thank I you. I would love to have that. I'd love to hear from Trish as well. So I just wanted to comment I was on the last visit and it was a great visit. And Bob, you don't ask too many questions. Keep asking the questions. But I did want to address a couple of them that you um, 
that you had that day and that you talked about um, tonight. One of the things that's going to be key when we talk about collaboration, you're right, a building isn't going to force collaboration. What's gonna happen is you need the leadership to build a culture within the building. And like Julia said, that takes a lot of professional development. But that's why hiring that principal is going to be key. They need to be able to understand the why behind the philosophy and build a culture amongst their staff to actually make that happen. Also, when it comes to the room usage, and uh, Mark and Jeff were touched upon that, scheduling is key. Um, we're not going to see teachers that have to run to opposite sides of the building like Vern talked about because we'll be scheduling them in vicinities. And sometimes, some of the schools we went to, some teachers were only in one class. It depends there were on the schedule, several, right? There were, there were several yes. where the teachers really did have their own room because they hadn't had put it enough students and enough. Exactly. So they did actually own the exactly. room. Exactly. It is a different, and, and I'm going to speak because I know it's a different design. And I'm going to speak to a year and a half, two years ago when we went on these visits. And one of the things that we talked about, and Julia, correct me if I'm wrong, because we might have had that conversation, was is this going to be an east? Like the East Building was definitely at, the, at that time a very cutting edge building. And we obviously don't build our buildings that way anymore. But this is a building we can grow with. This is a building that, as you were talking about before, it's going to have so much flexibility that as our needs may change over the next 10 years, that building will be able to be flexible with our needs. And I think we need to sort of keep that in mind. I know it's really scary, and I want to applaud you, Dr. Rogers, because, yeah, I think I went on all those visits, and I remember bringing students in and teachers and, and board members. We put a lot of work into that. And took please us a while. keep... It took us, frankly, a while to get convinced. Yeah. It so please easy. keep that in mind that we may not all agree but honor the work that has been put into this because a lot of work, especially these gentlemen, a lot of work has gone into this process. So thank you. Thank you, Trish. When you talk about hiring the, the right principal, we uh, met one of the principals at the schools that we went, and I'm not gonna name it, but um, <laughs> I also, I think it was the day before, we went to one of our own high schools at our board visit, and um, my kids go to this school, and so I get really emotional about thinking about our kids, and oh my goodness, for the love. Okay, so we have principals in our district, or people that are wanting to be principals, that have the ability to run this school because they are running our current schools and we have amazing staff. Now, there are going to be some, I know Bob talked about it was tough when Stansbury and Tooele opened, or when Stansbury opened, I, I wasn't here. It was tough to get people to jump over to Stansbury. And, and so I, I hate, I guess I shouldn't address it because I wasn't here and I know that there may have been there was some issues Bob had mentioned he was on TEA at the time and it was a fight our district has also grown it's turned over and I believe in our county and our employees that we will have the ability to hire the right staff for this building we owe it to our um, taxpayers to build it efficiently we owe it to our students and our teachers to be able to grow and um you know we've talked about um not doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result as the definition of insanity and if we're trying new things and if it doesn't work it still can go back to a traditional way if uh, i i can't see it with the way technology is and the way um, professional development and teaching is going, but um, I, I believe our staff is up to the task. Are there going to be some that don't go over to the building? Yes, there will be a large portion. I know Bob did bring this up, and I want he said, you don't have to, or we said you don't have to, but Bob did say, 
But there was not enough that wanted to leave Tooele to go to Stansbury, and some were forced. And so I think that's a question. I know Scott Bryan, you talk. Scott, you're up on the screen. That means, do you want to? Do you have a comment? Or Bob, do you want to comment to that? Because I brought you into it because I thought it was a good thing to say or a good thing that you brought up, Bob. Yeah, I, I can comment on that because traditionally when we've opened a building, and, and, and this is going to be no exception from what I, from what I know because I wasn't involved in a lot of the other conversations, but traditionally in opening two schools where you're combining boundaries, you're, you already have the staff in these buildings. These people are... You're going to have to move. You're going to have to move staff, whether it's voluntarily or involuntarily, because you're not going to go out and hire brand new staff for this building. Now, contrary to that, and his name was Dave, maybe? No, your name was Dave. I don't know. <laughs> Somebody's <laughs> name. The, the the principals. When I asked when I Rich, Rich. Rich. Yeah. when I asked him the question, it made a lot of sense in how he answered it. He answered the question that he was hired because he believed in the philosophy of how they wanted to carry on the education in this building. And he was given the ability to hire only those people that wanted to make the move. It makes a lot of sense at that point in time. But if we use the model that we've used before, I don't think it makes the sense that we're dealing with that Rich had. Because he had the discretion. Everybody in the, in the Davis district was off, had the ability to apply. He interviewed everyone. There was no expectation that if Bob Gowns didn't, didn't want to move, he could stay right where he was at, and they'd be happy that I had stayed there, probably. <laughs> but here, but here's, here's the reality. We already have teachers in all of the buildings that we're going to pull in the population into this building that they can't st everybody cannot stay where they're at. You are, whether they want to move, whether they don't want to move, you're going to have to involuntary transfer some. Mm -hmm. It only takes, and you guys that have been in PLCs, it only takes two or three doubters in every group to, to dismantle that. So that's part of the philosophy that I'm concerned about. Bob, and, and that's when I was jumping back up because you were just going there and I remember that conversation that we had and you're right. We can't discount experience that, that has happened in the district prior with building new buildings and having those forced transfers. But what I do think is we have time on our side. And so once we move forward with the design, that's when we need to start having meetings at, the local, at all of our high schools to talk about the why, the design, the philosophy, what it means, what it looks like. We can do small visits with teachers who are interested to be able to go and see some of the schools in action. I think as long as we do that, we need to make sure we do. If we say we do it, we do it, and we do it on a consistent basis. If we wait until the very last minute, it's not gonna work because you need to take that in. You need to see it. You need to understand what that means. And then I think we could actually be able to move people because then they understand, because we've got a couple of years. Yeah. But if we don't start doing that as soon as this design goes out, then we're already behind the eight ball. There are teachers that want to be at the school and don't even know they want to be at the school because they, they don't know about it. Yet. Well, and, can, and that's exactly what we're talking about tonight. There's, and it's even with the board, there's the concern, the concern is, sorry, I don't like it. After Bob, we need to let Scott have a turn, the okay? The concern is, Mark, is there's a lot of people that don't have the complete understanding of what's trying to be achieved. Well, and and I'm, not, I'm not criticizing the collaboration that went in. I'm not criticizing any of that. The problem is, is the, is the board is relatively new, and maybe even some of those that aren't as new haven't been on in those discussions. And I think that's the, I mean, we're, we're taking, you know, you're asking us to take a leap of faith saying this will work when in my, in my feel, my take on is buildings, you bet, a great building helps. Absolutely. Won't deny that. But a building is not going to do it all for you. You know, one thing that we, we did here, Bob, just to follow up on that too, is 
you know, we talked about high tech high, we talked about, well, the school that shall remain unknown, um, and then other principals that have talked about this, and one common thing that we hear from all of them is it's a leap of faith. And it's because it is a shift. It's a shift in the building, which I think is really important. We haven't talked about that tonight. We've talked about flexibility, collaboration, but that shift is on learning. And that's very different from, let's say, teaching. And so it is about learning. It's about a student-centered learning environment. And so that's what this building is designed around. And so that's something that's really key and important for you guys to understand. Go ahead. And we do Scott right. and then Alan. Yep. Okay. I, I guess it's a blessing to all of you that I'm virtual tonight because I have a full page of notes that I've taken. I, I could probably go on all night. Um, so, so many of the statements I would love to have followed up on and, and some of those things just don't make any sense to me still. Um, you know, the, the reality is we are building another East Elementary. Um, the, the very fact that we had to go to Minnesota to see one of these schools is exactly the, when the last days of East Elementary, and I don't know how many of you went there as a farewell assembly, but they talked about at the time when East Elementary was built, how people came from all over the country to see this new innovative design and learning environment and it's going to change education for decades and they, they talked about all these visitors that would come because this was the, the leading the bleeding edge the the, the place that people it was the mecca and they, they talked about that the the fact that we could only go to one school in st the state and then we had to go on an airplane to minnesota to see a another school indicates to me that we're on that bleeding edge. And my concern is we're not a Davis district. We don't have those funds and resources from the taxpayers. We just don't. And we, we're taking a leap of faith on something that's not necessarily tried and true. Uh, appreciating that we can build in some of those collaboration things, and I'm not discounting that those are important. But if this is the only way we can build collaboration, our district has a much larger problem. We have three other high schools in this valley that we're not doing in this building. We're, we're not tearing out classrooms and we're not building collaborative spaces. If the only way we can be successful is that we have to put teachers into a bullpen so that they can talk to each other, as a district, we have a lot larger problems we have to be able to be collaborative across the board. And if the only solution is that we have to do that, I'm really concerned. I, 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 so I just, we're building an East Elementary that will be torn down. If you think about it, West Elementary is much older than East was, and we're still using it because it was built on some of those basic foundational principles. And so that just scares me to death. You know, some of the other comments about, you know, we, we those teachers will naturally collaborate. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been into office environments where they build the, the, the low cubes with the idea that there will be collaboration. And you know what you see everywhere you go is they all have headphones on. And every one of them shuts out their neighbor and they put on their headphones. I think the other part that we're not taking into account is straight up just employee satisfaction. You know, the, the reality is what Bob talked about. We don't have a large enough district and, and not discounting what Trish said, but if we're going to go talk up this new school and tell everybody that this is the wave of the future and this is it, what are we telling the other three high schools and those teachers there? We're, we're saying, well, you don't get to go. You're not part of the future because this is the way we're going. And, and I think we've got to be sensitive to across the board to all of our staff. Um, I don't know, I, I just got, seriously, I got a page of notes and from various comments that, that a lot of you have made. And, and I just, it, it, it just has me sick that we could spend that money on, on, a, on a school and, and maybe pare back some of those things. I'm intrigued by the idea that you said that we could use it as a traditional school. Um, and that's what I, where I was going. What can we do to 
what would it look like to put teachers into their own classrooms and not force that collaboration, but use the same collaboration ideas as that we're using in all of our other schools. And, you know, using those spaces that we have allocated to teacher space, you know, will it make up for some of those classrooms? And, you know, maybe I realize that that might mean that we have some extra space. But I remember one other comment, Dr. Ernst said, you know, we don't want them teaching on their prep time. I get that, but the reality is in a growing district, the reality is we've had to. What happens when we're already at 95% and we have to, but we don't have anywhere for them to go? I, those are just questions that I've been asking myself. And I, I'm exceptionally nervous about taking a leap of faith with taxpayer money on that bleeding edge when our district is not that rich district. We're not Park City, guys. Uh, we're we're Twila, and we need to be exceptionally wise with those tax dollars. So those are my thoughts. Um, is it okay if we do you want to address those? Uh, we got Alan and Julia. Valerie, do you have any? Okay, so let's just go down. Alan, Valerie, Julia, you guys, I want to remind people this is a work meeting. And so this is really, really important um, to address all these concerns and answers because sometimes in a board and uh, another kind of the other kind of board meeting it's um anyways that's important so thank you so we're, you we're gonna take notes here as we're going yeah. so don't think i'm like checking the <laughs> the scores or something like that i just want to make sure we remember the questions as we're going okay, okay. Hey, one so, thing just to mention really quick and you yeah. guys may not be aware of it but there's four high schools currently under construction in utah and all four of them are designed around this and this methodology two existing that were designed around this as yeah. well prior to farmington yeah so skyline magna uh brighton logan, and hillcrest and logan high school and logan high school yeah so that you're you're we are 21 years into the 21st century yeah. so i would suggest we're not cutting edge right i mean this is the system that's out there and you're not the first high school to be built this way you're not even the second third fourth or fifth yeah right so go ahead Alan. um well you just answered uh my question which was <laughs> is this is this because uh, I, I recognize Scott's concern about, you know, is it basically uh, Farmington and us and that's it, you know. Um, so I guess I have two, two thoughts that I wanted to share. One is um, I, I've remained relatively silent and even now I don't find myself like firmly um, adopting a position because nothing has convinced me that uh the building design is is the make or break aspect of our children's education and so am i anti uh collaborative learning spaces and and provide i'm absolutely not but i i also don't think i think you can have educational success and academic success in your high schools regardless i guess of how i mean putting very bizarre designs uh, to the side. I think you can have success regardless. Um, and so if, if this gives us an opportunity to, like superintendent has talked about, um, you know, potentially improve or create a better culture, then, you know, I, I, I'm not opposed to it. The other thing I would say is um, the my fellow board members know that uh, I don't always make the visits and uh, other things, but this is not the first time in a bo in a work meeting that I've heard the F word. Um, <laughs> I had to think there for a minute. Well, meaning Farmington. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I, it, what, Scott Bryan didn't I, say I, it I under his breath. <laughs> No, but I, because I, I remember having very similar conversations and very similar concerns about teachers having the opportunity to spend time by themselves and, and that being one of my concerns two years ago or a year and a half ago or whatever it was. Um, and so I just wanted to make that point that I, re, I remember us having this discussion, working through it. I also don't remember us 
you know, in that board meeting necessarily coming to a consensus, you know, or feeling like, yeah, we all agree right as of this moment that the building should look like X. Um, Because it's probably because, you know, we may not ever come to that consensus about ultimately what, what the building should look like. But I'm comforted by the fact, like I said, that we can have academic success really regardless of what the building looks like as long as we have the right kind of culture. So. Well, and our, our job is to aid that rather than create it. And if we were charged with creating it, that would be an impossible task because the teaching is what happens inside that the students and the environment of the students. So our job is to really create the environment in which all of that will happen. Now, we firmly believe, though, that the way we design a building can definitely help. But you're right. I mean, teaching can happen in a cave, right? Or in a beautiful space, which is better, I think, is, is subjective. And that's one of the challenges of our architecture is that, that it is always subjective. And you're never going to get 100 people to all agree, say, that is a great building, even though it might be, right? Yeah. So it's tricky. But uh, our job is to really just give you what you need to be able to do the better job. The other thing about the, the teacher's satisfaction, if you remember uh, at the F word, um, it was a situation where the, the question was asked of the principal, what about your teacher satisfaction? And he said, only in the three years that they've been open, like only four teachers have left. And it was to do with promotion or a baby. So I think that's, that's the proof in the pudding right there. The other part I think is important is um, that other school looks really fancy. Right? Everybody that's seen it, it looks fancy. The perception is, my heavens, only Davis could afford that. Only Park City could afford it. You might be surprised to know that it was bid at the same time as Union High School, out in Roosevelt, and Provo High School, down in Provo, and it was bid for far less than both of those schools. So it, why do I say that? Am I trying to you know, say that those other districts did something. No, they built what was appropriate for their district and their community. What, I'm, what I want you to take away from that is good design doesn't have to cost more money. Yeah. It costs more creativity. It costs more of us sitting in our office at three in the morning coming up with wild and crazy colors and all this fun stuff that works for a district, right? But don't let something that looks good suddenly be something that is burdensome on the cost side. That's not the case. You've hired a CMGC who knows how to make projects fit into your budget, and you've hired an architect who knows how to make the building be inspiring for your students. Now, why does, it, why does this stuff matter? Because this is really what it comes down to. Surveys have been done with corporate uh, officers and owners, and Vern and I are two of them. What is it that we're looking for in employees? What is it that we're looking for as students graduate and work in our office or in other places? the top things that people want, an employee who is collaborative, who is communicative, they know how to talk with each other, they know how to express themselves, and they're creative. That's across the board. This was from IBM to Microsoft to a Caterpillar, all sorts of large companies. And critical thinkers. Critical thinkers was another. So the point is, why does it matter? I can play baseball in a dirt parking lot. I can learn to play baseball a whole heck of a lot better if I have a, a very uh, effective venue to learn how to play in, right? And so we agree 100%. The teachers are key. You could put a, teach, a, a good, awesome teacher in a, in a Connex box, and they could teach a student how to read, how to love education. Absolutely. The question is, is, there, is it a value to you as a district? to provide a venue that doesn't cost any more than a traditional building, but gives your students space to inspire them and to engage their minds in a way that will help them be, to become even more prepared when they step out into that marketplace and have to compete with students that have gone to other spaces that facilitate that collaborative uh, environment. And that's a decision only you guys can make. That's right. Julia, then Valerie. Okay, so since it doesn't have to be a lot to have a really great building cost-wise, I want to know if we can get that historical wallpaper. What, <laughs> where was that? I want that under $100,000. Can you do that for me? <laughs> it's 
Yeah, the timeline. I love that. I want that in this building. <laughs> no, okay, so seriously. Okay, I totally. <laughs> I'm sure we can work something. Oh, yeah. I, re I really wanted to put it around yeah, my whole house. We'll have environmental graphics that you're going to love. And, mm -hmm. and we can work in timelines, whatever that is. And also, this was a social studies science kind of a timeline that had the history of the U.S. and big, you know, like. Well, it had the, the, the whole, it had the whole it, globe. I mean, it had. So we actually did that in a school in Arizona. We did, like, from the history of the prehistoric age all the way up through, and it felt was on the hallway floor. Geologic history, the, history, 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 the Industrial history. Revolution, all, 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 kinds of all sorts of things. So, yes, it will be in there in some fashion. We'll make it yours, though. Now, what was your other? You had another okay. question, I think. So, so, okay, I totally agree that the quality of the teacher is what is the quality of education. I mean, the quality of our Tier 1 instruction mm -hmm. is how what's going to happen with our kids. And... I totally agree. I, 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 so my part of my point is, we did a lot of collaboration, but maybe not as a whole board because a lot of us went on the visits and we collaborated through the visits. We collaborated mm -hmm. in the car, and that was not including the whole board. So some of us have a lot different perspective than others, and yeah, and obviously others have full time jobs and and, and couldn't um, involve be involved in that. But I do believe, as you have said, that the opportunity of the building is, just gives us a better opportunity to increase, not, not, not the teacher, the teacher's the most important, but to help and aid and, and, and give a better opportunity for students to learn. And I, I, I just wanted to <laughs> um, respond to Scott because, okay, East was not a good building. There were two, two of them built in Utah at the time, and people did come from all over to see it. But when it was built here, it was on the cutting edge of collaboration. It had a staff that believed in what that building was. And for the first several years, it was, it was better than what we're doing now. I mean, the collaboration was great in that building. And then different teachers came in, different philosophies ended up trying to put up walls and the whole thing. But I mean, you know, it, it was like the first of what we're, what we're seeing right now, I think. And I think collaboration is here to stay. I think we need to do something in this building for the next 50 years because the buildings we're in right now it, were created when we were trying to go to the Industrial Revolution, you know? And, and now we're, we're done with that. We're, we're moving into a whole different revolution and in that core governance building book it talks about the six C's which are many of the C's that you have just um, said so we need we, we need to be aware of that as we're moving forward and I, I mean I, I think that collaboration is the tried and true way because it's, it's, it's been around for a long time it's not it's not first started it's you know, I mean, when we built Clark Johnson, they were building buildings that had the garage door to, to move different walls and, and different things. I mean, and you know, that, that was more when collaboration wasn't as cemented as it is now. And I think our district really needs some help. <laughs> Not help, but a lot, of, a lot of collaborating teams aren't what they need to be. Now, I, having said that, I think a lot of that falls back for responsibility on the principal and the department, and there needs to be some accountability. That's what's gonna make that better, but I think the building will at least help in that. So those are all my comments. Okay. All right. Valerie. You're giving me a turn? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Um, so I agree with the collaboration. I never would have survived my first year of teaching without other teachers. Um, but And I, I missed the opportunity to go see the high school. There was one opportunity for me, and I was out of town. So I apologize. I realize this is probably frustrating. But um, all I've seen is pictures. So is every classroom lined with a whole bunch of glass? Uh, it Depends on which classroom you're talking about, but for your classrooms in your building, it will be lined with, with as much glass as you are comfortable with. Okay, so that's not something that's necessarily been determined. 
you know, what we would what we would tell you is going back to that comment about collaboration spaces are the most effectively used when they're as uh, supervisable as possible. So if you had a four foot narrow window, your likelihood of sending kids out where you couldn't see them, I'm, I'm drawing an extreme example here to, to help explain why. You probably wouldn't send your kids out there because you couldn't see them. So that's why we say the more glass, the better. Okay, so. But it's one wall, right? It's one wall. It's only one. one of the and then we, wall. the way we design these classrooms, you have three teaching walls. So you don't have a whiteboard at one spot all the other walls are your teaching and projection surfaces. So you can teach yeah. anywhere in that room other than that, that fourth wall. It's Even almost like this room right here. Can you go back on the yeah, slides? There's a picture of one you can see. It. It's probably five slides back. Okay, so Keep when, when um, maybe you take into consideration students with learning disabilities right. or um, uh, distraction problems, mm -hmm. Um, has that been uh, an issue in other schools where you you can see everything going on and great question you know where it you? comes up you know that, that does it comes up you know when we do these types of schools and spaces and that usually when you talk to like even rich up at the uh, other school the uh, f word um, even at that school he said it usually is about a week and then it goes away. The and then it, they adjust the to it. The kids adjust and they get used to it. Yeah. And we would add that to the elementary school. Yeah. Superintendent Rogers, you'll remember this. We took the district on a tour of an elementary school that's set up in a collaborative model. And they have 20 foot wide glass overhead doors at every classroom. And there's eight classrooms in a suite, right? And then this large collaboration space they all open onto. Every one of the classrooms had the 20 foot door wide open. Kids are moving all over the place and it was noisy. And we walk in and Dr. Rogers and another teacher went right into one of the teachers and said, this is like stage, you guys set this up, right? And they said, this is 80% of our school year looks like this. And the kid, you walk through the hallway and the kids don't even turn around. So it's that process of acclimatizing yourself to the environment. As soon as that happens, which is typically a week or two, the disruptions are extremely okay. rare. It's kind of like masks. We said our kids would wear masks and they wear them. Yeah. 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 And w one other thing to take a, a take a note of that large glass wall that you're seeing on that picture is only open onto the collaborative space. It's not a main corridor or a place where people are going to be moving past. It's really specific for those four classrooms or those six classrooms. And so that that big glass wall is really just an extension of your classroom rather than on the main thoroughfare. And then you can see that white surface where the teacher's standing. That, really that wraps teacher. all the way around that space for all of the walls. So you can teach from any one of those locations. We thought it was interesting, Valerie, you would, some of these, not on this picture, but at some schools that went all the way to the ground so that oh. kids could sit on the ground like flexible seating. Correct. And that whiteboard was the whole wall yep. surface. In elementaries, we do that a lot because you have little kids, a seven foot whiteboard doesn't do a lot, but a zero to six feet, is more usable so we do okay. that a lot as well i know i just know there are points in time where i'd have my class in the palm of my hands and then somebody would walk in and it's like mm -hmm. but but i'm sure i i see how there could be an adjustment period and and i know high school is different too so, yeah. so no. they're very adaptable learning environments and so another thing you can see that ties into that is the projector in the room it's a laser projector it sits on a little stool down at the bottom of wheels they can move that to any wall in the classroom so it's extremely adaptable mm, to the teacher's needs 12 foot image on the wall. Yeah. um and then also what about like um teachers desks and how do you how does that work great question yeah. so in in this specific case and again this depends on the district and how you want to approach it in this instance the teacher had their own office so they had a cart that we talked about this earlier where they had a cart because the assumption was I'm going to have to leave my office and go clear down to the other end of the hall to my classroom and then go clear down to that end of the hall. In reality, their office is outside this suite and there's six classrooms in this suite and they spend almost their entire day and some their, their entire day in one room, the rest of them within that suite. And so that cart that the district purchased to be there they could put their purse in it or their backpack or their books or whatever it is, tends to park in that classroom and not move. So the principal had said if they could do it again, they wouldn't have bought them at all. They have a lectern where the, the laptop can be set and they can move that around with them and walk around the classroom. Their laptop goes with them wherever they go. 
So it, it's worked out what very well. What about mill work and storage for books and maps? And I'm just thinking social studies, pull out a map kind of. A, what about the mill work in the classroom? Sure. So there's not a lot of mill work in this configuration. We've done other schools that have more. Um, most of the work in this is digitally done. So you'll notice there aren't uh, flags hanging from the ceiling. There aren't pictures all over the place. It's because the teacher doesn't own the room, right? So if you're displaying flags and those kinds of things, a lot of the way in this building that they do that is digitally, that they'll project that. We do have other facilities that are done this way that have more mill work in that space. And that came from a district that was just a little more nervous that that maybe doesn't give them everything they need in that room. Right, and so it kind of depends on how you want to handle it. But and we have found that they can handle that without owning that room and displaying all and those pieces. And uh, anecdotally, interestingly enough, when we were programming this space, um, there was a concern about, but the teachers love to decorate their rooms and put up all their posters and, 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 and everything like that. And what we found was is that it released the teachers from having to do that. And so it was an idea of being able to display digitally what they needed to that day for that lesson for that month and then be able to pull away and not have to worry about decorating all of these walls. So that was interesting. And I think that works on a high school level. Yeah. But they could, they could get level. together as a pod and say, here's sure. where we're teaching science. Let's put some science stickers up in here or yeah. some, yeah. you know. Yeah. In regards to teacher storage, maybe to add really quick. So each of these houses, we call them small learning communities, each of these have a large storage area and the teachers have the ability to access that storage area and it's, it's lockable storage. So the teachers still have quite a bit of storage that they can utilize. It runs the length of the house actually, kind of right in the middle, close to their offices. Okay. The other thing I just wanted to mention is in terms of like you were talking about maps or maybe a periodic table or those types of teaching aids that sometimes go on walls, what's great is with Google Classroom and Canvas, we can put those resources in our LMS. So even when our students are home, they, they don't have. need to be in the classroom to see those resources because those teaching aids are now going to be in a digital format that's accessible to them 24 seven. Okay, we've got, oh, sorry, Valerie, are no. you still going? Thank you. Are you good? Appreciate it. Okay, we've got Alan and then Camille. Okay. Never thought you'd hear so much from me, but, um, <laughs> And I think we are on, what, two hours on item one of the agenda? Yep. So that's a party. But it's important, Alan. <laughs> oh, it's, it's crucial. Important. It's absolutely fundamental. Um, keep moving our legs. That's, that's right. <laughs> yeah. okay, you guys have been going. standing keep the going. whole keep time. Keep going. Keep this going. is like this. the modified version of waterboarding or something. But, <laughs> um, like I'm about to win a car. <laughs> that's right. I... Uh, so one thing I was, because a lot of the discussion tonight um, is, has been around the C word, <laughs> collaborative, right? And, and meaning, sorry, I'm sorry, um, which, ne which, which necessarily means, uh, or I think most of the time means I'm talking to somebody, right? I mean, a lot of the times it means I'm opening Sometimes my mouth and I'm speaking to some extent. And there's been some interesting literature, I think, that's that's been written. Um, and two books I'm thinking of in particular. One is The Power of Quiet, talking about the value of and sometimes the unrecognized value of introverts in our society. And, and all we do is prize the extrovert. Mm -hmm. um, and then a, a book that talks about leadership. So, uh, leadership through solitude mm -hmm. um, and great leaders over 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 decades uh, you know really gathering strength by being by themselves sure. um, and so I guess my question is you know can the introverted teacher succeed in in this environment that's a great question maybe we can address the introverted student and I think you have some fantastic folks here that could probably address the introverted teacher better than we can. But can you back up the slide? I think it's one more. Right there. So there's something important to notice about this image. The first image, if you look at those kids in that space, that's very relaxed and a social setting. Some introverted students are not comfortable in that kind of a setting. However, it is a quiet space. It's not, if you look at the end of that hallway, it's that same social, relaxed setting, but it's also exposed to everybody walking through that hallway. 
The next one is a setting where it's a conference table. It's more formatted and formal. It's enclosed, acoustically isolated. The point there is that's three different techniques. And by the way, that's, those spaces are open to anybody. So teachers can go in there. Students can go in there. They just check it out. Some of the spaces, they don't even check out. They just, it's open. They walk in, they sit down, and they do their work. The point is those are treated differently specifically to accommodate what you're talking about. You have a kid that's not wanting to sit in the commons with 500 students. One, a, a, a design technique that we use is at the media center where it's very quiet. We like to create part of that media center where we pull it outside the quiet media center, but it's disconnected from the commons that's raucous and loud and a lot of movement. So a kid can come up to that spot, be a little more secluded. They're not right in the middle of everybody, but they're not in the media center where they're just completely concealed, right? And we provide that flexibility so they can land where they're comfortable. We, we saw a couple of them that uh, Alan, and I can't remember which school, but they were in the what's traditionally the library, the media center, and they had these little kind of pod chairs. And I remember talking to one student who said, you know, I don't like, sometimes I've sat out there with friends, but sometimes I just don't, I don't know, I can't stand my friends. And I want to, yep. she had earbuds on and was reading a book in the library during it. And I go, well, aren't you supposed to be in class? She says, I don't have, I released a parent. I'm, I don't have that. I'm allowed to come into the library and I'm just reading. So now, now here's what's cool about that. Furniture is easy to change. Building rooms is expensive and it's hard to add, right? So doing that kind of flexibility through furniture that you can modify as student needs change over time in a space that's flexible enough to accommodate all those needs is the ideal. If we make it too regimented where you can't change it, that is what the students have. That's all they have to work with. I don't know if somebody has a comment on the teacher side of an introverted teacher. You can address that, Trish. And while Trish is coming up, one, one aspect, come on up, Trish. One aspect, too, to think about is with those introverted kids, you know, is bullying. And it's yes. a big issue in schools. Absolutely. And one thing that we found is a benefit of the glass in every building that's been designed this way we found this is one in four kids are bullied. That's a reality, right? And so we learned this at the school up north is uh, there's there's basically zero bullying events that have occurred. What was it? They there was had, one they had to drive each other to a park. And that's have a right. Fight. Yes, and that's they drove each other they back. They decided to have back. a fight, but they and did so it off campus. They're just yeah. they're not seeing those events, and that's the biggest benefit. Is if you put them on the stage, those bullying events aren't going to occur. They're looking for the dark corner where they can do that type of thing. And the introverted teacher is really no different. I mean, they have those same spaces. That does come into consideration when hiring your staff, though. I mean, if there's somebody who seriously shudders by being around teachers, then it's not going to be the best situation. Um, but I think ultimately there is space for them. And I also think that we need to remember that those collaborative spaces are rarely going to have everyone in there sometimes they might even be by themselves so I think when they need that quiet time by themselves there's availability throughout the school um, but then there's the, the flexibility again I don't think it's just collaboration this building provides a lot of flexibility um, there's flexibility for them to also be able to meet in a group I just wanted to say thank you you guys I, I as a taxpayer and involved in the school board and stuff. I appreciate the flexibility of the building. I heard that a lot when we were running our bond campaign that, like um, Melissa mentioned, the utilization of our buildings or, well, why don't you guys think outside of the box and not do everything the same for every single classroom because every classroom has a unique need, right? So I really like the flexibility of each of the rooms. And I think that to Trisha's point, we don't know where we're going to be in 10 years. We may see a decline in students. I, I don't think we're going to see that. Um, but, and also too, you know, if we open at capacity, it's because we need another school. And we already know that. We already know that we're seeing the growth and we know that we're seeing these things. I think if we want to sit down and build a 6A school, then that's what we need to do. But we don't have the budget and the ability to do it. So that's why I really like this school, though. I think it's a great, it's an advantage as a taxpayer. You know, we can utilize all of the spaces, not only from our students and our teachers, but as a community. So thank you. Mel, that, that's a great point. I would point out, we haven't mentioned this, um, but one of the things that we try and do at VCBO is to think about 
20 years down the road when you do have to add spaces because your classrooms are growing we have two approaches one is we ignore that scenario because we're not there anymore and then you're parking 15 portables somewhere that wasn't ever really thought about we like to give you at least some tools to be able to address that if and when it happens and so in this design if you on the the far east end can you forward through to that uh, the second floor plan real quick right uh, right there so if you see that red uh, long block in the middle that's the office area to the right hand side there's some kind of a medium blue there's four spaces there's a gray space at the bottom right corner and then and then three light blue spaces directly above that is an open roof so if you look down to the left those are two stories of classrooms on that spot i was just talking about it's single story right that second level instead of putting joists and metal deck and, and insulation up there and building you a roof what we're doing is building a concrete slab like the one you're standing on and then putting tapered insulation over it so it's a floor that's temporarily a roof and in 10 years when you need to add on you have the room to add on six hey. additional space classrooms plus collaboration space DJ, go to the next slide. instead of moving kids out into a portable that can't function in that same way as the rest of the students in the school there's there's space that's set aside and prepared so you don't have to go and tear half the thing apart you can hire a contractor to come in and build that from the outside add that portion on and the rest of your building is still in operation Dave didn't you say there was also an option to put another wing in up front there uh, was it to the right so these three and to the right of that, didn't you say so that? To the right, that's option? the single story. And that's where we're saying you have the CTE down below okay. that's in the basement, basically. Then the next level is your early childhood and your facts. Above that is that roof that we're saying we're building it as a concrete slab so you can simply add on that next layer. Okay. And but, that would be your extra six classrooms. But that's also where the board or the school district both all will have to think about. We've decided that our school Correct. sizes, kids, should be... A certain number. 2,000 students We're 18 or whatever to 2,000. So 4, 4A is what we've, I mean, if it stays that way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Correct. that's an interesting thing. Yes, we can add on, um, but does would that kick us up to 5A? And, you know, we're really trying to create a community here in Tooele County so we're not traveling all over sure. the state of Utah um, for different events either. And so, if, anyways, but that's just, it goes back to what Julie was saying. You pointed that out. Also, the other thing, I'm sorry, Julie, I just wanted to point out one last thing too that you guys had mentioned. Um, and I think about this all the time with all of the new construction happening in our county. If you look at some of the older houses and their utility costs versus what this building, it makes sense to do some of these designs for the taxpayer. Sure. You know, and like you said, just because it, it looks nicer doesn't mean it costs more and same like the different ideas and the direction of the building and how it saves on all of those costs i i appreciate that and so sure. i think that's important that the taxpayer understands so to give you a couple quick pointers of what that means if you look on that plan and the the long light gray section with the little gray dots or the black dots on it those are your two gymnasiums with skylights and that other school that shall not be named, or uh, Ben Lohman. No, no, it was Ben Lohman. Well, that one also. Oh. Those are set up. You can turn all of the lights off. And on a sunny day, if you took a foot candle meter for the amount of light that's in there, at both of those schools, the measurement is over 70 foot candles. So a classroom is traditionally 50 foot candles. On a dim day, so it's overcast, you're in the 30 to 40 foot candles without even turning your lights on. So that's a one-time purchase. For the life of the building, you have that availability to save that energy. We, we do other design tools, extending roof elements to, to shade windows so your mechanical system gets smaller. Those are things that don't add cost. It's just the time to think through them to try and make sure you can capitalize on them. So you're saying that Alan Morrison might even be able to make a basket without the lights on? Maybe. <laughs> Trying to decide if that was a dig or a compliment or neither. <laughs> I, you told me you, you used the lights out. I just thought that's what you were talking about. <laughs> all I do is make shots, all right? <laughs> Julia. So it, yeah. if we add those extra classrooms, so how does that, with the whole, like, common area space and things like that, lunchroom, is that, it can handle that many students with, common, oh, yeah. with the common spaces? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Not a problem that's at all. That's great. 
yeah. didn't think about that. Every well, time we uh, add, we never add to the common space in yeah. it. Totally. Right. Well, and, and to be honest, the flexibility of this design is that the commons and the lunchroom specifically is on one level, that lower level. But the commons itself is actually spread over three floors. And that central core could be blown up. And so in reality, your lunchroom isn't just on one level, much like that other school up there, you have, you have two different levels. Well, here we actually have three. So it's yeah. actually, um, you're, you're never gonna need that with up to yeah. 2,000 students. Uh, they can really spread out. Mm -hmm. But with even more, I think you could, you, could, you, could. you could utilize that and not be bothered at all. Ooh, I don't see any green lights. So, oh, so Scott. Yeah, I don't have a light, sorry. Um, a, a couple observations. I, I, I think we're mixing things up sometimes. Um, you know, again, not discounting um, utility costs, for instance, that was brought up in this conversation. I would expect that that would be the same at any school. It, not you know, not so, at all. some of not these things, a, a new school that's being designed, I would have an expectation that they would have those same kind of cost savings built into the design. Mm -hmm. Let's not mix the utility cost ups with some of these other conversations we're having about collaboration. Uh, utilities and collaboration aren't necessarily part of the same. We can be frugal with our taxpayer dollars with, with a well-designed building in, in a lot of other ways. And so that's just one example. I, I you know, we won't go through the rest of my notes, but um, I guess the one observation here, and it's, it's fairly clear the direction that this board's going. And so, you know, I'm clearly on the outside looking in on this topic. The, but, but that being said, I, I do have some serious concerns about student safety. Um, you know, the, the glass walls. Um, we, when we talk about um, you know, an active shooter training. We talk about run, hide, and fight. Well, there's no hiding in a, a classroom with a wall exposed that's all glass. Um, I, and the other observation is, is that, you know, we said that at Farmington High School that uh, there was a conscious decision to, to spread the teachers out so there's more, t you know, eyes on the, on the halls. And um, if you know, they're, they're in these collaborative pods that you talk about. I, I'm concerned about student safety. And, you know, thinking back to my days, you know, high school and those in Twilla that are natives would appreciate, you know, I can still picture, um, you know, Hogar Tixon standing outside his hall, outside his door between every class. And, and those teachers and that, um, they provided that element of safety that, that really does go into a school setting. Um, so I guess while I'm on the mi minority about uh, the collaborative design, I, I still have some concerns about the full glass walls, as well as teachers all grouped into, um, you know, not spread throughout the halls. And you mentioned that at Farmington, they, they did spread those teachers through the halls. And I would suggest that at a minimum that we build those walls in the classrooms with at least enough space that there can be hiding that can occur in case of those. Uh, I would expect that if I had a student that we didn't build those and, and you know, with glass walls with nowhere to hide. And, and the second thing I would ask is that we do at least consider spreading the teachers out up and down the hall so that at least there's more eyes in the halls. Um, and th if that means they have their own space and you know their own offices, I would think that that would be a minimum that we still apply. And again, we can have collaboration and we're gonna have collaboration in those other high schools. And I would think that we would still consider doing that for nothing else than student safety. So Scott, if I can address that really quick, um, we literally, we could sit here and talk with, with all of you for hours about security because it's something that we're extremely passionate about. But one of our first rules is that we don't talk about the specific techniques that we use in public settings because we our intent is not to share that information with people who might try to use that information to to circumvent those efforts so um i'm as we 
give you the answers that we do. Just know there's a lot more detail that in private we would be happy to talk with you as a board about the details of what we do and why. Um, but um, just know that we, uh, we have a security consultant who is an um, ex-SEAL uh, Team 3 uh, sniper who uh, works with um, Joint Special Operations Command, other organizations to secure embassies, to secure forward operating bases in military situations, to secure churches, corporate offices, and everything else, and is probably the most experienced type of individual to know how glass performs in those kinds of situations, right? Their job is to, to circumvent that glass. Um, and we rely on them heavily to understand what that glass will do, what kind of glass works well in that situation, and what doesn't work well. Um, so that being said, just know that there's a lot of science and experience that goes into that layout. And in private, we would be more than happy to walk you through the details of that approach. And we asked the, um, I'm the principal at Farmington, we had the, the, those exact questions. And he said that, um, I don't know who came into their school, but they said it was the safest school, one of the safest schools in the nation because there are no hiding spots for an active shooter and they could get to him faster. And with the technology, Scott, that they had talked about, um, I, I know that you'd be comfortable with the situation, but it is considered one of the safest high schools in the nation. And I think I remember when I think Skyline is being built and I heard rumblings that, oh, there's this glass thing. And I kind of thought the same thing, Scott. I was like, oh, geez, especially after all, you know, and that was designed, I think, right after one of the um, big right. shootings. And yeah, that's what I was going to say. And I heard rumblings. Well, now that we heard the, you know, from Farmington High School and the technology behind it, I'm more apt to do this over a, I mean, I look through my kids, Sansbury, Antwila, and Grantsville going through. Oh, so, yeah, there is a reason. Yeah. Two things so, I can tell you that um, that are probably okay to talk about. One is... The, the way those types of events are solved is by a police officer getting to the event. That's 99% of those situations statistically are ended when a police officer engages an individual that's doing that. So the point is, the faster that officer can get from the front door of the building to where the event occurs, the quicker that event is stopped. And if you imagine coming into a building and your job is to walk into a building and from any corner you could be engaged by someone, an active shooter, if you can see immediately for 100 yards, immediately, and see if there's a threat, you can move through a building that much faster. If you walk into an old school building that's all masonry, you have to clear every closet, every bathroom, every office, every classroom before you can get to where that event is unfolding. And so as these uh, security experts that we uh, have brought on our team have said, the ability to come into that building and immediately see threats and engage threats means you can stop those issues dramatically faster than you can in spaces that are very concealed and, and opaque, if that makes sense. We should talk about this a little bit too, but this will come up as well. But you mentioned run, hide, fight. And so that's one of the aspects that the security consultant will get into as well. But, but it, it's kind of a nomenclature change. He, it shouldn't be run, hide, and fight. It should be run or hide or fight. And so you don't know what your options are going to be if mm -hmm. you're anybody, a teacher, a student, whoever it might be. And so that is another aspect of this plan. And so what I think we'll do is we'll develop a security plan for the entire campus. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to be important so that you guys feel comfortable with where it's going in the design, but also your community does as well. The other thing, just to, just to address it, uh, Scott, was the idea that of of uh, putting the teachers on the main street and spreading them out. We had the conversation during programming whether we should have the teachers in individual offices or in clusters, and it was driven that we would say no individual offices, we want them together to collab. And so you'll notice on the plan that those teacher collabs are actually spread out across the whole school, and that wall, there will be a wall of glass from the teacher collaboration out onto that main street so students can see that they're being watched. So that will cut down on almost all of your bullying on that main road.
I know. <laughs> Alan said, let him sit down. <laughs> um, Whatever it takes. I feel like the, I'm so sorry, those of you that came, especially presenters that are waiting to present, but um, I hope 